Okay. Um, well, uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your sticking with us uh, this late in the evening. Um, tonight, uh, we're, we're doing a presentation called Seeing Beyond Boundaries, Understanding Your Land at Different Scales. And the idea here is to, to begin at, a, at the scale of, of your backyard, your parcel, and then to zoom out and see what that parcel, what your land might look like in a larger ecological context, and then zoom back in to figure out how, uh, how your land management, or how the creation of that land might be a little different with that larger ecological context. So that's our goal for tonight. Um, you, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. You've already passed the first test uh, of logging in to Microsoft Teams, uh, so we, we very much appreciate that. Um, please uh, find the, the Teams toolbar, and you'll see that there, uh, there's a video, a microphone, and chat. Um, feel free to use the chat anytime during the presentation. You can write questions in there, um, and, uh, and Andrea and I are going to switch off uh, um, staffing that chat. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wait to answer questions. I'll, we'll do four different breaks over the course of, that's the chat box. We'll do four different um, breaks over the course of the, the presentation. And so when we pause for a break, uh, we'll read off the, the questions that are in the chat. And because there are not many of us tonight, you can also choose to unmute your mic at that time and, and ask your questions directly. Um, <clears throat> Andrea and I have already introduced ourselves, uh, but uh, but but she's the brains of this operation with uh, with real on the ground experience, and and I'm just going to take things into a, a, a different context. That's my my part of this. Um, we want to begin again at that that the, the, that landowner scale, that parcel scale, and so uh, I'll show you a video from a from a landowner. Um, to get a sense of, of what they love about their land and how they've been managing it. And then we'll begin to zoom out. We'll think about um, um, Mink the Bear, and I'll tell you that story. Uh, and then we'll talk about concepts like forest blocks and habitat connectors and special habitats. And then Andrea will take over with the, the land management section. So again, please do feel free to write questions in the chat during the presentation, and we'll handle them at the next break. So let me just begin with a little bit about where we're coming from. At the uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, we believe in the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. That is a huge mission. It takes us into a, a variety of different types of conservation from, yes, working with uh, species of fish, wildlife, and plants, but also thinking about habitats, natural communities, and even finer filter elements uh, like invertebrates. Um, so we work at all sorts of different scales, and, and I'm going to pick up more on that theme uh, over the course of the night. Uh, this broad mission also takes us into working with all sorts of different people. And so, yes, hunters, anglers, trappers, wildlife watchers are, are certainly part of our constituency, but we're also very focused on future generations and, and, and working with whole municipalities or, or communities. Um, and that's really where, where my work comes in. I work for the, the Community Wildlife Program, and so we do municipal level uh, technical assistance. Annika, um, excuse me, uh, Andrea works with um, individual uh, landowners uh, and, and helps with on the ground management. All right. So uh, I said I wanted to begin this with an interview. Uh, and, uh, and so I wanted to think a little bit about uh, one parcel in particular, uh, the Hawkins parcel in, in South Stratford, Vermont. And it so happens that I actually have a connection to this, uh, to this parcel as well. The, the Hawkins are my in-laws. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time there. Uh, from from walking our dogs uh, in pajamas on Easter morning uh, to uh, to uh, getting our uh, the boy's grandfather to take them on tractor rides, uh, so I have a, a lot of love for the this this place. Um, so let me just uh, share with you a uh, an interview uh, with the landowner. <clears throat> oh wait, uh, I need to make it so you can hear this. 
Um, excuse me one second. I just, I'm so sorry. It just occurred to me that I need to set this up a little bit differently. Now there's some checkbox. Got it. All right, let's try this again. My wife, Joey, and I bought this land 45 years um, and have lived on it for 41 of those years. Can you all hear this? I think it needs to go up just a little louder. Um, I have to say that. All right, let's that, try this. Again. Hi, Sorry I'm John thinking. Hawkins. I live in Stratford and my wife, Joey, and I bought this land 45 years ago. Um, and have lived on it for 41 of those years. Um, I have to say that we, we didn't pay much attention. We appreciated where we lived. It was, it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful place, but we weren't that involved with it. It was like a nice background, a place you could go on walks. Um, about four and a half years ago, we both took the coverts training um, and that totally changed our approach to our land, our appreciation of it, and our understanding. And out of the coverage training has come many, many things. I immediately, the following year, took the game of logging, which probably saved my life and taught me that for over 50 years, I had been using a series of chainsaws, unbelievably unsafely, doing all kinds of stupid things and not taking very good care of them. Um, another thing we did was um, we got involved with the NRCS and had uh, got a grant for some timber stand improvement and invasive removal. In addition to the game of logging that worked with the NRCS, um, we became tree farmers. So that was another sort of step in, in learning what we really had to do to meet the requirements of a program that I think is really quite useful. Um, at the same time, all of this was going on. I planted a orchard of 24 trees representing 19 different varieties. And that's been a learning experience for me too. It's something I wanted to do since I was a kid. I grew up in an orange grove in Southern California and my, my family was in the orange business for years. Then I went off and did all sorts of other things, but I've really never lost my affinity for orchards. There's a, there's a sort of a short story that occurred to me yesterday after Jens asked me to, to talk to you. Um, about, about three or four months ago, I, it, it was getting to the point where my trees were actually becoming, my orchard trees were actually becoming trees. And I suddenly wanted one of those very nice orchard ladders with a pointed top that you can stick up in the tree. Um, and it'd be very useful because I still have four apple trees that I planted here 40 years ago and just never paid any attention to. And some of them are now gigantic. The ones I planted are semi dwarf, so I'm probably doing over with my ladder. But I, I, I looked at them and discovered they were very expensive. And then it suddenly occurred to me that I'd seen an article in a book called The Yankee Way with Wood. It explained how to build your own orchard ladder. And all I needed, needed to do was find a 25 foot nice straight spruce and um, an oak or an ash for, for the rungs and I could build it myself. And I, I, I really realized that had it not been for the cupboards training, I a, wouldn't have been able to identify any of those trees. Uh, the game of logging enabled me to cut them down in, in, in somewhat difficult conditions fairly safely. And it enabled me just yesterday to look at my first choice, an ash uh, that I was gonna cut down uh, and say, that tree is a little dangerous, I'll leave it alone. So I went on to another smaller one. But it also made me very cognizant of, our, of the issues we're having with emerald ash borers. We decided you know, that we aren't gonna go cutting down ash trees like crazy. Uh, maybe we have one that will survive, but this one, this ash tree happened to be available in the right place, the right size. And it wasn't one of my great big old oak trees, which were the other candidates for, for um, apple ladder runs. So that to me was sort of a, 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 a story that kind of connects our experience with coverts, 
with the game of logging, with the land, with our appreciation for it. So I, I really have to say that our forest has, has improved our appreciation of both the woods and wildlife, deepened our knowledge vastly, and really increased our appreciation for what we all share in Vermont. Um, that's really grounded in reality and very much deeper than we first think it is. So this, this whole thing for us, this whole involvement with coverts, the programs that they put on, the programs that Fish and Wildlife put on, the game of logging has been an incredibly rich experience and one in which we've learned an immense amount. Oh, and by the way, we have a lot more interesting birds since we did our clear cut on, for, for birds too. So um, that's it. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, John, uh, thanks, thanks so much for for sharing that with you with us. And and I just I I love that interview because it, it grounds us in 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 our family's experience on the land and and how the Hawkins have have changed over time uh, and come to to come to appreciate their land in a different way. Now, my interaction on that land. Uh, has 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 also changed over the over the years, and I've come to to love it. Uh, and and we have pretty frequent bear encounters uh, on the land there in Stratford. And and this summer I was walking our dogs, and and sure enough, we came uh, very close uh, to to this bear, and and she stared at us for for quite a while, and and we whisked our dogs away as quickly as we could. Um, but it got me thinking about bear movement in the larger area. Uh, and I did a little bit of research. <clears throat> and it turns out uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a bear that has been called mink um, happened to, to come through the upper valley. And uh, on this map, point 53, uh, somewhere in this region uh, is, is the Hawkins land. Uh, and so I started uh, learning a little bit more about Mink and, and her travels uh, and just how much she'd moved around the area uh, because we, we were pretty sure we had seen her one, one day. So uh, it turns out that Mary Holland um, had been blogging about Mink uh, and was able to get some incredible photos uh, of, of, of this animal and, and her cubs. And it was just so awesome to, to see that other people had had experience uh, with this animal. Now, bears like mink uh, happen to uh, move around a lot to, to get what they need. So it shouldn't be any surprise that, that we've seen bear moving through. Um, oftentimes, uh, bears will, will use wetlands, some of the, the first uh, plants to green up in the spring to get food. Um, and then in the summer, they might use berries or, uh, or you know, uh, on the power line right of ways. And then in the fall, they might go up onto the ridge to get beech nuts or acorns. So bear are moving around a lot to get what they need. And as I did more research, I learned that, that this uh, trip uh, from Mink uh, around the Upper Valley was actually just the beginning of it, that she had done uh, some sizable movements. So this is Montpelier, this is Rutland, and we're over here by Ira. Uh, so between uh, October 1st and the 11th of November in 2018, Mink moved around a, a tremendous amount. Uh, and uh, and that journey was even even bigger uh, than we had thought. So bears are moving around a tremendous amount. Here's another example from southern Vermont, um, where uh, where we can see a variety of, of um, uh, where we can see a bear 32, a female, um, and her movements over from uh, July of 2014 to November of 2016. Uh, and you can see how those movements changed. Uh, and in different years, uh, there was different food availability. You see that there was a poor beech nut crop in, um, in, uh, in 2014 and a much better crop in 2015 and how, those, how she moved uh, to address those, those food shortages. Uh, here's another one, uh, um, another female that moved about 65 kilometers uh, in, during that 2014 poor beech nut uh, year and went all the way down into Massachusetts and around uh, and, and came back up. Um, and then here's another one, still a male bear uh, that did about a 19 kilometer uh, trip 
to seek out some corn uh, near Pennington uh, and then heading, headed back to the, the reservoir here. Uh, <clears throat> and lastly, here's another uh, bear uh, that was collared as part of this uh, wind turbine study that did about a 140 kilometer trip uh, over towards Brattleboro and back, uh, which is pretty uncharacteristic uh, to move so close uh, uh, to that. So bear are moving around a lot to get what we need, what they need. So our experience on the land of just seeing bear zipping through is actually much a part of a much, much bigger ecological phenomenon of movement in response to, to food, different food availability over the course of, of, of different years. So that's just our first section on, on Mink the Bear. Um, any questions, quick questions uh, so far? Nothing's popped up in the chat, but if, uh, if anyone has anything, feel free to unmute yourself. No worries, there'll be more. I have a question. Oh, please, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, how do you find the travels of mink that you showed us just now? Oh, uh, so um, that, that bear was collared by New Hampshire Fish and Game um, and so I get updates from the bear biologist in New Hampshire, and that's how I first learned about mink, because uh, he sent uh, Vermont biologists some um, uh, just some, some snapshots of that data. Um, it, ben Killam, uh, the bear biologist, uh, currently uh, is, is analyzing that data. So it's not exactly so publicly available. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Darn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yems, is it true that she passed away, but her one of her cubs is still alive? That is true, yes. Yeah, but they Ben Killam has uh, one of her cubs? Two uh, cubs. No, not the cub, but the, the data. Oh, I no, thought they, they, no. two. Yes, there are two cubs. Oh, yeah. good, good, nice. Yeah, great. So again, I'm just trying to take our experience on the land and, and zoom out a bit. And so let me show you uh, some maps uh, about what this all might look like. So black bear have a home range of at least 30 square miles. Uh, and I'll just put a 30 square mile block here on the map. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a large forest block of 14,000 acres. And here's what that 30 square mile home range looks like. So most forest blocks in Vermont aren't sufficient uh, in and of themselves uh, as a bear home range. So they're moving a lot, they're crossing roads uh, to get what they need, uh, uh, these different foods at different times of the year. <clears throat> now, if we think about this in a different sort of mapped environment, um, I went on to, to BioFinder, and that's a publicly available online uh, mapping site, um, and it hosts Vermont Conservation Design, uh, which is a, a prioritization of the lands and waters in Vermont that are most important for ecological function. And so I zoomed into the Hawkins parcel here that, uh, that you see on screen, and the dark green suggests that the uh, almost the entire parcel is highest priority from this statewide perspective. Well, gosh, you know, as a landowner, well, what, what are we supposed to do with that? Um, so uh, it might be helpful to, to begin to take that highest priority rank and parse it out into its parts. So uh, if you just click anywhere on, on the map in BioFinder, it brings up this list of uh, what elements are present on that particular place. And so you can see that this, ranks, this parcel ranks as highest priority as a connectivity block uh, and a priority as an interior forest block. So uh, let's dig in a little bit more uh, to what that means. If we zoom out, and here in, in purple, you can see the Hawkins parcel, uh, you can get a sense of, of how important it is for as a large forest and, and a connectivity area across the, the, the upper valley. <clears throat> Let me um, show you though, there have been really significant changes over the last 50 years in Vermont uh, to the pattern of our forest. So I just wanna give you a little bit more of an idea of why that connectivity piece might be so important. So 
Here's uh, Stowe, Vermont. Uh, this is Route 100. Uh, that's the turn for Moscow Road. Uh, and it's this is an aerial photo from 1962 that I got from the State Archives. And I have colored uh, forest uh, for this year. Um, and from my perspective here in 1962, this forest block is still connected north to south and east to west. This is an intact forest system. But let's look at what's happened over time. Here we are in 1974, the first roads get punched in. 1980, a couple more roads. 1996, uh, we see some development on those roads and each of the houses has their own little pond. Here we are in 2007 and 2011. Now, from my standpoint, uh, this block is no longer connected uh, north to south. It's questionable whether it's connected east to west. Now, the astute observer will say, yeah, hey, there's still trees here. And you're right, those are trees, but they're less than 20 acres. They're completely surrounded by roads and development. So that's no longer forest. But there is uh, still a good bit of forest on this map. And actually the amount of green, the amount of forest has not changed over this uh, 50 year period. Um, some of the old fields uh, down here grew in that you might not have noticed. So the total amount of forest has stayed relatively relatively the same, uh, and yet the pattern of that forest has changed dramatically. Again, no longer uh, connected. It's more of an island of forest in a sea of development than a sea of forest with islands of development. So let's think a little bit more about this concept of, of large forest blocks and, and what they might do for us. So large forest blocks in your town and your uh, that your parcel might be a part of, they're going to provide biological diversity, larger forests, more biological diversity. They provide scenery, clean air and water. They provide land uh, for, for the working landscape, for, for the forest industry. Um, their economic benefits of recreation and tourism. Uh, these large forest blocks help prevent erosion and reduce flooding. Uh, they provide land for hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, and the economic benefits that come along with those. Large forest blocks transmit fewer tick-borne illnesses because there's less edge. Uh, and of course, they sequester carbon and absorb uh, gases. Uh, not only that, and these are sort of cultural and, and, uh, and ecological values, but they're also a huge uh, economic uh, driver. Uh, the forest products, uh, forest recreation and tourism provide 1.9 billion to Vermont's economy annually. Uh, forest products add another 1.5 billion, uh, and that's about 12% of Vermont's GDP or 20,000 jobs. Uh, fall foliage is 25% uh, of tourist income in Vermont in most non-pandemic years. Um, hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing account for $685 million to Vermont economy each year. And intact wetlands and riparian areas are, are, are saving us millions of dollars uh, from flooding. So we're, we're getting at these values of these cultural values and these ecological values and these economic values on why these larger forest blocks are, are so important. So I started telling you a little bit about BioFinder and I put the, uh, the Hawkins parcel on the map. Uh, and it said that it was a high, it was a priority for uh, interior forest. And what that means is interior forest is the deep dark woods and the highest priority uh, interior forest are the largest um, and the most diverse. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that those are, are critically important, must have core forest for the overall network uh, in Vermont. Priority forests are, are important supporting lands that, that play a role in, in supporting those, those even larger core areas. And so you can see the Hawkins parcel here in this larger context, surrounded by these highest priority forests and in, in and of themselves playing an incredibly important supportive role uh, in, in, in that area. Now, we can also think about other species. I talked about mink the bear having this 30 plus square mile home range, but there are other species that move around a lot to get what they need. Uh, bobcat in the Champlain Valley have a 27 mile home range. 
male bobcat are moving about 19 miles per day. Uh, river otter uh, have a home range of 15 to 30 linear stream miles, and moose have a home range of 2 to 20 square miles. So bear aren't the only ones moving through this area to get what they need. So, um, so that brings us to this concept of connectivity, of how the forest blocks are arranged to connect to one another. And I had said earlier that that Harkins parcel is considered highest priority from that uh, perspective of connectivity. And here you can really see why. This whole arm of the upper valley that connects uh, and down here connects over to the greens. And what an important uh, connection, forested connection, that is across the whole region. So this one parcel is playing a role in a much, much larger system of animal movement across the whole area. Now, this isn't just so a bear can get from one side of the road to another. In the context of climate change, whole populations of plants and animals are adjusting their range in the face of a of changing climate. Nature Conservancy is estimating that whole species are moving uh, about a mile per year uh, north and south away from the equator. And in Vermont, it's much more complicated. It's not just a due north movement. Um, it's also an east-west movement uh, and uh, up in elevation movement. But these dark orange, these connectivity blocks are the lands and waters that connect the, the Sutton Mountains of Quebec to the Berkshires and the Taconics and the Adirondacks and the White Mountains. These are the lands uh, that, that hold that whole network together. The concept is this, we don't want isolated habitats, isolated islands of habitat. We do want connected habitats where upland patches are connected down to the wetlands, where these rivers have riparian streamside vegetation all along them that serves as a connector. Um, and so the whole system is, is interconnected. Barriers, examples of barriers, roads, development, agriculture, uh, that sort of thing. Let me show you what this might look like for a different animal. So I mentioned that bobcat have a home range of 27 square miles. This is some more telemetry data, i.e. the GPS collars of a bobcat uh, in, um, in Shelburne, Vermont. And this is the northern part of Shelburne Pond. And uh, where did that bobcat spend its time? Well, in the forest, it's a mixed forest, but you'll notice they, he wasn't out in the open fields. He was along the edge. In the wetland itself, where in the summer there's good cover and in the winter it's frozen and, and uh, able to, for movement. But look at this. <clears throat> From the perspective of that bobcat, this tree line and hedgerow along this driveway was sufficient cover for the bobcat to move between this area of good quality habitat and that area of good quality habitat. So for the bobcat, what the connector looked like was really just a hedgerow. Now, this is going to be different for different species, but the concept is the same of connect the blocks. I'll show it to you here. Uh, this is Rutland County. Uh, we're down in Otter Valley Union High Schools there. Uh, and so this is the pattern. We have these large core forest blocks, these interior forest blocks, uh, and they are the anchors of our, of our habitat network. Then we have these smaller forest blocks, and they're serving as stepping stones. So they may not have a lot of ecological, uh, a long list of ecological attributes uh, in and of themselves, but that function of connectivity is so important because they play a role as a stepping stone. You can't get from this forest block to that forest block without using this one as a stepping stone. And while we're on the subject of connectors, we can get even more specific and think about these wildlife road crossings where there's good quality trees on both sides of the road that allow for movement from the core to the stepping stone. And we should also uh, note this, the, the streams, the, the river and stream network is probably the single most important type of connector in bringing this whole pattern together. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so this is the sort of network that we're looking for with habitat connectivity, these interior forest core blocks and, and these different uh, types of connectors uh, and this network of connectivity across the state. Okay, how is that? Uh, any questions so far? Uh, we had one leftover question that kind of popped up uh, after you started talking again, but um, just going back to the bear tracking, um, are those records publicly available, the ones from our department? Uh, I don't think they've been released yet, but they yeah. will be. They're still crunching the data. That was part of uh, the Deerfield wind study. So all that telemetry data was being used to see what effect the wind turbines had on bear movement. Um, so they're still crunching the data. The biologists were a little bit concerned uh, about releasing it because it was actually available in real time. And so they didn't want to release it because they were worried uh, that the animals might get poached if folks knew exactly where they were. Uh, but everything we do, uh, it will eventually be publicly available. Um, and Terry wanted to know if the bobcats are still being monitored for that project that you mentioned in Shelburne. <clears throat> no, uh, they're they're not. That was, I think, 2004, um, and they uh, they kept the collars on for six months um, and had them every 20 minutes. But uh, this was, you know, 2004, so the data was on the collar, so it wasn't uh, cell phone enabled or anything. So they had to actually retrieve the collar to get the data. Uh, and at one point, a cat actually climbed down into a cave, and the, the biologist had to start digging out rock to retrieve the collar. So there's some funny stories there, but no, Terry, they're not available. But uh, I think some of the cats certainly went into Williston, uh, and I can show you those next time we meet. Looks like that's it right now. All right. Okay, but folks, don't don't hesitate to ask a question. I'm happy to handle it. All right, so I'm just going to go back to this pattern uh, that we had talked about uh, of this 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 network, um, and and stress that surface water and riparian area, the streams and rivers. And so I'll show you what that looks like here in Stratford, um, and and you can see the way that uh, if you can. Uh, uh, look at the forest cover here um, and the extent to which this surface water and riparian area network really knits all of these pieces of forest together. So this is the, the single most important connector uh, in my mind, an, an incredibly important piece element for, for climate resilience. And then as we zoom into the, the parcel itself, uh, you can see the, the pond here uh, and that the, there are certain areas uh, that are considered highest priority for this surface water and riparian area network uh, across the parcel. Uh, so, you know, in terms of land management, might want to manage those a little differently than the surrounding, uh, than the surrounding forest. Now, I'd also talked about wildlife road crossings as a type of connector. Um, and certainly, we, we have seen bear uh, cross Algebrook Road here. Again, this is the Hawkins parcel. And all of Algebrook Road does show up as a, as a terrestrial wildlife crossing. Now, this data uh, is based on a model. It's where wildlife are likely to cross roads. Uh, but it, it certainly should be taken with a grain of salt. It's an indication that your parcel is playing a role in this bigger network. Uh, but it's not the most accurate in the world. Um, you know, there are places where there are fields on one side, that's likely not a wildlife crossing. It's this area where there's more forest on both sides of the road. So take it with a grain of salt, but it does suggest uh, that, that your, your road frontage, perhaps, is playing a, a, playing a role in this larger network. <clears throat> And then uh, I just wanted to, to add one more little tidbit here and talk about road crossings uh, and that not all animals are crossing over the road, uh, that there's a, a tremendous amount of under the road movement that we need to take, take into account. Now, bear like mink are, are pretty choosy about their structures. 
Uh, this is Route 17 in Starksboro, and I think it's one of five structures that we've ever seen bear uh, going under, uh, where bear go under the road. Um, so they're very choosy about their, their culverts, but they are using them. There are an estimated 400,000 culverts uh, across Vermont, uh, you know, varying from uh, one foot to, I don't know what, 30 feet. And, um, and so for some species, this network of culverts and bridges is providing opportunities for crossing uh, under the road in a safe way, and other species not so much. So this concept of wildlife road crossings is both about over the road crossing and also under the road crossing. I'll add that I work very closely with the Agency of Transportation. They're a tremendous partner on, on these issues. And because they've been appropriately sizing, i.e. oversizing, structures for flood resiliency, that also allows for dry ground like this uh, for wildlife movement um, uh, under the, uh, through these culverts. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to say uh, about the interaction of wildlife and the road network, but I just wanted to, to tease that a little bit uh, to get you thinking about, well, it's not just the forest part of my parcel that might be playing a, a role here in this larger network. It could also be my, my road frontage. All right. <clears throat> um, Andrea, can I turn this over to you, please? And I'll just keep it on my screen if you want. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so now we're going to kind of jump down into a more uh, localized view of the Hawkins parcel and talk about some different land management activities that John and his family can do to really enhance uh, the parcel for wildlife and for forest health and also meet all of those landowner objectives that, that he has. Um, so first, let's quickly just review um, some of the things that Ants talked about with the parcel, that it is an interior forest, so it has a lot of diversity and importance um, in the future and will have more importance in the future as we move through climate change. Um, it's a really important high priority connective block for both wildlife and the movement of plants as climate change progresses. Um, and then it also has the connected riparian area um, and pond that plays into the larger network of streams and rivers in the state. Um, so, so John kind of mentioned a lot of different programs that he was involved in in his video, and he also kind of had a laundry list of different objectives and things that he wanted to, to uh, really um, get out of his property, and they, they have evolved since they, they started owning the property 40 years ago. Um, but he's part of the current use program, so he has a forest management plan and a consulting forester to help him with some resources. He's part of the tree, uh, the tree farm program, which has, comes with another great support network of, of professionals and, and guides and, and just uh, other people involved in owning land, uh, as well as the coverts program. Uh, John was really excited about having a little apple orchard to to uh, work in and to grow fruit in. Um, and he also mentioned things about uh, treating his invasive plants and um, just enhancing the whole forest and parcel as a whole for different wildlife, for forest birds um, and and things like that. So when we when we look at the parcel, some things that he can do to um, increase the diversity and increase the um, the food and structure that are available for wildlife that are going to be moving through the forest are really simple things like identifying which trees are going to be producing food, um, whether it's cherries or acorns or um, hickory nuts or even wild apple trees. Um, so he can release those in, in the forest and um, try to get those to produce more fruit. Um, he's, he's treated and controlled invasive plants which not only uh, reduce the amount of competition that our native plants have, but they also increase the amount of native insects that are going to be in the forest and are going to be the, the base of the food web that are going to feed the rest of, of the native birds and mammals and, and other critters that are, are moving around. Um, with, the, with his apple orchard, John's really going to want to have a lot of, of native pollinators around. So enhancing all of the native plants that are in the area uh, kind of cutting back on the amount of mowing that he's doing around that area and, and making sure that um, there is habitat for our native our native bee species to be living in to uh, be pollinating his 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 apple trees are going to be an important thing. Um, John also mentioned uh, doing some timber stand improvement 
which is basically kind of thinning the forest. So you, you're picking the healthy trees, you're keeping them, the ones that are going to be lasting the longest in, in the forest and creating structure and, and habitat for animals that way. Um, these are all, all programs and, and activities that a lot of landowners do, and there's a lot of information available for them uh, out there. Uh, and then finally, one of the one of the other things, knowing that there's a riparian area and a pond um, that connects to other net, other stream networks in the state um, is creating a riparian buffer. So basically creating kind of a space between the edge of the water and um, in the forest and planting native plants or letting things grow and trees fall down and just creating an area where we know that animals are going to be moving back and forth um, in that area. Um, you know, Jens talked a lot about connectivity um, with big mammals, the moose, bears, bobcats, really big things. But we also need to consider the connectivity of um, of pollinators and amphibians and smaller animals. And that's going to be really important on the Hawkins property as well, simply because they have both that riparian area and the upland forest. And that's a huge connection for um, salamanders and, and frogs and other amphibians. So making sure that there's connecting uh, connected vegetation between those two spots is, is really important. Um, so yeah, next slide. Um, so I compiled a list of all of these landowner resources that are available uh, mostly for free and for the public um, that you can take advantage of. There's it's a variety of things, whether you want to um, look at some websites and just get some reference information, learn about invasive species, the different um, birds that are going to be on your property. These are really easy to use um, apps and websites that are, are um, really accessible. Um, John listed a bunch of different organizations that he's involved in, uh, from Vermont Cover to the Tree Farm Association. He was involved with the NRCS uh, programs. And these are all organizations that have done a tremendous job um, in the wake of, of COVID to providing some really great online resources that you can ex access uh, right now, just whether it's on a YouTube channel or different um, websites with information that they've, they've uh, compiled together. And then lastly, of course, um, your friendly state <laughs> biologists and foresters are available to come and help provide site visits and, and information and answer personalized questions. And there's also a bunch of other conservation or conservation organizations like Audubon um, that are available to help um, answer questions as well. So uh, next, next slide. And then Jens talked about BioFinder quite a bit, and that is um, a accessible free uh, resource uh, put out by our by the state and it's very simple to use. Uh, Jens has also got some great training videos and does a bunch of webinars on how to use this if you're not familiar to uh, to the program, but it, it's simple. You can type in your your address, find your find your property and see how it fits onto the landscape. Next slide. <laughs> And then, of course, uh, here's our contact information. If you have any questions about how to use any of the resources that I've listed and how to use BioFinder, or if you just have general questions about habitat, um, land, the landscape, uh, any kind of projects, um, we're here to here to answer questions. And if we can't answer your questions, uh, we're happy to direct you to the person that can. So next slide. And um, just a plug right here, if you are um, if you want to continue to support some of the work that Jens and I do um, and the things that we've talked about today, there's some different options that are available to you to, to get involved. And um, it's between buying a habitat stamp, which supports um, buying public publicly accessible lands and um, providing, you know, creating opportunities for technical assistance for for landowners. Um, and then also the non game wildlife fund, which funds a lot of the, the projects that Jens talked about and um, our, our non-game species. You can access those on our website as well. And so with that, um, we're happy to take any kind of questions or you know listen to some comments and uh, just thank you for joining us. So again, folks, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, what sort of uh, questions or comments have come up for folks? Um, I can tell you in our in our uh, the chat box. Let's see. It says um, 
so the BioFinder is available on the Fish and Wildlife website. Um, yeah, just not, Google uh, Google BioFinder.Vermont.gov uh, and you'll you'll get there. Yeah. Um, Bob Z wanted to put a plug in for the Wyndham Regional Woodland Association as a great resource for landowners down in southern Vermont and Wyndham County, and I second that recommendation. They're a great resource. Um, and then let's see, we had a question says in the Jonathan said in the conservation design, to what extent is the connectivity rating based on visualizing the maps or aerial photos or computer assist, computer assisted modeling on one hand compared to the on the ground observation, either a single field visit or monitoring over time? Um, the, the connectivity uh, the connectivity blocks in BioFinder. Uh, was an uh, expert-driven selection process. So there are 4,052 forest blocks in Vermont that are larger than 20 acres. And so uh, the Vermont Conservation Design core team uh, got together and used a selection process to select something like 900 of those blocks that make a connected pattern. Now, it's more complicated than just looking at, at, at which blocks look really close together because it also utilized the, the surface water network in terms of which blocks were connected by surface waters and this concept of physical landscape diversity. So some of the blocks that are part of this connected, connected uh, connectivity network um, are, uh, are, for example, in, out in the Champlain Valley. And there are areas of great diversity in the physical landscape, which will hold biological diversity into the future. And so some of the connectivity blocks are, are, were selected to connect to those areas with the help of the surface water and riparian area network. Um, so uh, it's a pretty complicated iterative process, but you can go onto the BioFinder website and read the component abstract for connectivity blocks that will talk you through that. Great. That was a tough question to, to read through, but good answer. Um, then uh, Max will want to know if there are any financial incentives for those with some of the critical blocks or connectivity um, layers in BioFinder to maintain them. And um, I can answer that. Uh, so through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the, the EQIP program, which is one of the biggest, um, kind of the only only funding source for landowners to be doing work, um, we when we write plans and uh, submit applications for landowners to the to the projects, um, we include where they are in Vermont conservation design and highlight the importance of a parcel in terms of connectivity or special habitats and things like that. So it it increases the the ranking of that parcel to be selected for projects, but there's not a direct financial incentive just because you're in a connectivity block. And um, I'll, uh, I see Alan Clark wrote uh, link uh, wants a link to the BioFinder video um, that he keeps going to BioFinder and not getting it to work right uh, on an iPad. Um, Alan, tough business on an iPad because it involves so much zooming in and out, but it is supposed to work. Um, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll meet with you uh, online and, and, and talk you through use of BioFinder step by step. Uh, the, in terms of videos, it's the same interface as the a &R Atlas. So any of the help videos for the a &R Atlas will also help you use BioFinder. But again, I'm, I'm happy to talk you through the specifics of, of BioFinder. It could also just be a, uh, a bandwidth issue. If you have a very slow connection, I don't know where you live. If it's a very slow connection, uh, it, it bogs down. Um, and it's also true if we get lots and lots of users at the same time, like a rainy day, it actually bogs down as well because there's so many people using the mapping site. Uh, Andrea, one for you. Uh, can you tell Terry more about the coverage program? Yeah, of course. And um, John Hawkins also wants to to plug it a little bit. He's more than welcome to unmute. Um, <laughs> but Terry, coverage is it's a peer to peer network program. So it's it's based on on landowners and creating a network of landowners that are in connection with each other. And um, 
each year, well, in a typical year, not a COVID year, um, Covert sponsors two three-day trainings that are for, that are free for landowners, and we do three days of, of trainings, of talks, of, of forest walks. You get a bunch of resources, including textbooks, um, access to uh, professionals to answer all of your questions, and it's just a really great um, kind of introduction to to owning forest land and, and learning how you can manage it for uh, wildlife and, and forest health. And it's just, they do a ton of programming over during the year. Um, they've been hosting uh, weekly video chats with professional foresters and biologists and, and other, other professionals. Um, but John, um, do you wanna pump it at all? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think it's the single greatest source of information about um, forest and wildlife for property owners that we have available in Vermont. And um, I can't tell you how it's changed our outlook on our land. And um, it, it, just things like coming to appreciate snags and um, the kinds of things that, that, that people from the city want, cut, want to cut down right away because they're really ugly. Um, I would. Um, I, I don't know, Jens or, or Andrea, if you if you could uh, um, hook them up with um, an address for um, for coverts, um, yeah. that would be the thing to do. If you uh, could you give them address, I'll just throw it in the chat. Excuse me. It, it, I'll, if you want the URL, I'll just throw it in the chat. Okay. Why don't you do that, and I will put um, Lisa Sauceville, who's the uh, executive director. I will put her. Um, email address in the chat as soon as I get off. But I can't say enough enough good things about coverts. And we have our meetings when we have our meetings non non COVID times, and we see both Jens and Andrea at our meetings. So um, they're good. Yeah. Well, yeah, Terry. It looks yeah, but the pandemic, of course. Keep keeping keep looking for uh, future trainings with them because they're they're great. Great. Um, any other? Yeah, Alan, I see your note that you live in Plainfield. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it should work. We'll, I'll, um, just shoot me an email. We, we can work on it with you. Uh, any other questions or comments from folks? Just another plug for coverts. Oh, it looks like Kate Donahue has a question. Feel free, Kate, unmute. If you can, I'm just sending you a hands up. Thank oh, you. oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Maxfield. <laughs> I put Lisa's address in the in the chat too. Oh, Thanks, awesome. John. Thank you. And and John, I, I tried not to embarrass you, but thank you so much uh, for for your involvement in all of this and and using your land as a case study has been really wonderful. So thank you. You're welcome, Yance, but you did embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything okay. else, folks? All right, so everybody. How, oh, how, how, do we, how do we find this uh, later if I want to check out the travels oh. of Mink? Yeah, I um, so uh, we record all of these sessions and they are available on the the same um, trainings site that uh, that you signed up on. I'll just put that back in the chat. Uh, so here's the this is the trainings uh, the URL for the trainings. And so, uh, as soon we'll we'll select the best one of the, the the two sessions of this that we've done, and then we'll post it. Uh, so I would expect uh, to, uh, I, and I'm happy to send you that URL uh, in the next couple of days if you'd rather not wait. Uh, but it'll be available on that URL uh, when you um, in the new year. Great, thank you. All right, folks, have a great night. Thank you all so much for being with us. Yeah, enjoy the snow. <laughs>